Great. Okay. Good to go. I will start admitting. Sure. Yes. Hi, Alan. Welcome. Good morning. Yeah, almost afternoon <laughs> or noon. Yeah. I've been tracking the uh, salmon recovery conference. I had a heck of a time getting involved, and yesterday was a difficult day with meeting from seven thirty till eight o'clock. I know. Yeah. God, lots of lots of Zoom time. <laughs> Did uh, uh, Andrew report back on the meeting last night? No, I haven't been able to connect with Andrew yet. I've been in meetings and um, things a lot of today so far, and I don't know if I'll have a chance to, to connect with them. Yeah. Before the end of today, maybe I'll try to text, text Andrew. Hi, Shannon. Oh, you are oh, muted. There you go. Yeah, hello. Shannon, there was some interesting work on uh, DNA down at Tulalip and showing that uh, they got a lot of fish from other areas dipping into the estuary uh, Chinook. Uh, uh, and some of this eDNA can be of value to trace quantities in areas. Yeah, I heard, I heard that years ago that, uh, that there was a Chinook that were uh, of not uh, that weren't of that origin that, that actually were in river there so yeah i don't know whether salmon straight they just do that and um this was migrants on the way out okay and we'll just give folks a few more minutes um, before getting started I use the example of the Columbia uh, or uh, Mount St. Helens when it blew its top. Uh, the coho decided not to go up that river and they, they went south and went up a different system. And, and uh, hmm. salmon are very, uh, very adaptive to uh, conditions. Uh, I've seen them come and go in the lower end of Squalicum, the pink salmon. Um, tried to colonize in there once and then the city and all their wisdom went in and dug up all the reds on an odd year they didn't know what was going on so yeah they did they know what they like and here we are trying to train them hi mary All right, I'm gonna just give latecomers one to two more minutes um, and then we will we'll kick it off.
Okay, well, I'll keep admitting people as they join because in true office hours fashion, you can pop in at any time here, hang out for the <laughs> whole time, pop out as needed, munch your lunch, whatever you, <laughs> whatever you need to do with this half hour. Um, but I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, my name is Anya Sameko. I'm the Digital Engagement Manager at Resources. Um, I've been here for about seven months, so I'm a little new to the team, but not new to the world of policy and environmental protections. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with Carly um, running us through office hours for Washington's legislative session that just wrapped up last week. Um, we're going to use this half hour today. Um, you can pop in with your questions. I've got some questions that the community has asked from people who couldn't attend today. And we're just going to kind of run through the nitty gritty of what went down in the legislative session, um, some of the bills that passed, didn't pass, um, and what we can look forward to in the next year. So Carly, would you like to introduce yourself? I know, I know a lot of people on here already know who you are, but um, give them a little background. Yeah, thanks, Anya. And hey, everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Carly Dethridge. I'm the Land and Water Policy Manager for Resources. And um, yeah, we engage in the legislative session and 2021 was a pretty big year, as you will probably hear and maybe you've already heard, at least for, for climate related legislation. And um, yeah, we're just excited that you're here to join us and this is meant to be an informal conversation so people can ask their questions about, you know, the nitty gritty, what went on during legislative session. Um, and then I will let folks know that this is being recorded for people that weren't able to join and who wanted to listen in later. So just a heads up, um, but you're welcome to, you know, unmute yourself and ask questions or type your questions into the chat. I'm happy to answer questions that way as well. But Anya is our lovely facilitator, so she will move us along and we have about 30 minutes um, or so, unless there's just loads of questions and interest. I'm happy to stay a little longer too. And Carly, I'm just gonna kick us off and then I'll open it up um, for questions for people here. But for some people who are new to our organization and new to our community, can you just give us a quick overview of what a legislation is and uh, a legislative session is and what resources does to participate in that? Yeah, so the legislative session is something that happens every year, um, generally from January until April, at least, um, let me back up and say that, that we operate in two year legislative cycles. So this was the first year of the legislative cycle um, where the legislature passes a budget um, for, for shovel related projects, capital projects, or, and an operating budget, which is funding for um, employees or to local governments to do work. Um, and so we're in the long session that just wrapped up. It was four months long. Um, next year is a short session that's only two years long. And it's, um, they often pass a supplemental budget for anything that might have been needed that didn't get addressed in the full um, budgeting process for this year. Um, and resources engages in the legislative session, um, even though we are a, a small organization that is pretty focused on issues in Whatcom and Skagit counties related to the health of our environment and communities. Um, oftentimes, there's a need to, for, to engage because, for example, you know, water rights in the Nooksack watershed are often influenced by what's happening at the state level, whether that's a policy matter or, you know, funding, which is what we at Resources were advocating for. Um, funding and for water rights adjudication to, to, to start to commence um, in 2021 with the actual process of adjudication being filed in 2023. So that's just one example. Um, we also bring a local perspective um, 
and we have strong connections with our legislators in the 40th district and the 42nd district um, as well. So that's kind of our, um, over, that's an overview um, and I'm happy to answer questions if that sparked any, any questions for people. Yeah, thanks so much, Parley. And I'll open it up uh, to the meeting now if anybody wants to come off mute and has questions for Carly about our work or just this legislative session in general. Um, she's our expert and happy to answer. You're also welcome to throw them in the chat as well um, if you wanna type one out. Okay, not seeing any questions come up yet, so I'm gonna jump in. Um, Oh, Carol is on. Oh, yeah. Carol, yes. so, is unmuted. First yeah. of all, I want to say um, I really appreciate the work that you're doing at Resources, and I follow all of the water, all of the complex water work that you've been doing to get education, adjudication, and um, protect the water resources. I've really been um, paying attention to the fairness of the process, and really appreciate that. Um, I have a question that I'm not sure is is too much related, but you know, with all of the climate activity that we're doing and trying to go green and hoping that this new phase of everything and going back is not going to be really going back. One concern I'm having, and I don't know if you know about this, is this issue about bringing nuclear back. And I don't know if resources is looking at that right now or not, but I'm extremely concerned. So I just thought I would throw that in. Yeah, thanks for that, Carol. I would say that we, as an organization, to my knowledge, haven't taken a stance on nuclear energy. And I know that a lot of attention is being focused on that as an alternative source from fossil fuels, but it's definitely something for us to consider and look at and possibly develop a position statement. But I will say that our executive director, Shannon, is also on the call. So if Shannon wants to chime in with with her thoughts, she's welcome to do so. But um, I will also preface and say that I um, focus predominantly on water and land use issues. And we're in the process of bringing on um, my counterpart who also works on policy, but from a climate and energy perspective. So that person will be starting in the next month or two. Typically I'm focused on water and land use um, and that person will, will take on those issues alongside me for local, local policy as well as state policy. Carol, I, uh, this is Shannon, and without going into too much depth, uh, certainly I think as we're, everyone on this call is aware, uh, nuclear energy has the advantage of not producing um, greenhouse gases, however, has uh, its own host of severe problems and um, unresolvable issues at this point. So we, uh, I think that that's right. We don't have official policy. Maybe we have a unofficial policy of that. We believe there are better strategies to move forward for our region than nuclear energy. But if there was a meaningful proposal moving forward, we would have to go in further depth and articulate exactly why and how. And um, certainly if there are, other resources that you have or policies or work that you think has been really helpful on that that might not be uh, and might not be aware of, do let us know because that's always helpful to hear. And Carly, we've got a question from Shannon. What um, what was the outcome outcome of the shoreline bill? Yeah, Shannon, are you referring to the? Um, the shoreline armoring replacement bill. I think it was Senate Bill 5273. Uh, shoreline protections uh, with regard to development. What, was there not a bill? I think there was a bill related to that. Yeah. Yeah, there was a bill, um, like I just mentioned. So it did pass um, the legislature and, and this bill Basically, it's someone who owns shoreline property and they have a seawall or bulkhead that's protecting their property from erosion um, and that seawall is basically failing or damaged. Um, the, it requires 
in order to to replace that that infrastructure there it requires the uh, property owner to go through an analysis of um, you know before reverting back to shoreline armoring or seawalls um, what's the least impactful alternative that I can do that not only protects the environment but also protects my property to some extent from from erosion um, by waves and the reason why just for background because some people may not be familiar with with shoreline bulkheads and armoring and why there's issues associated with them um, it's because you know those those structures are basically cutting off the natural erosion processes that feed um, beaches and and the habitat that uh, forage fish rely upon, which forage fish are the food choice of salmon. Um, so that's why um, this is, it's been an issue, an ongoing issue in Puget Sound with all of these like hardened shorelines that have made habitat uh, disappear over time uh, by not having that natural erosion process take place. Does anyone else on the call have a question for Carly about this legislative session? Yeah, Mary. Oh. Hi, I do have a question, Carly. I'm curious um, with respect to um, net ecological gain and incorporating climate policies into growth management plans. Um, those two did not, unfortunately, get past the legislative hurdles that were in place. I'm wondering, was there a lot of pressure or pushback from the development community? Was that one of the reasons why they failed to make it? Or were there other reasons? Because I think this is the second time we've taken a run at net ecological gain and failed to pass it. When I say we, I don't mean resources, I mean the entire Environmental Priorities Coalition. Yeah, um, so the, I can't speak to the specifics as to why the net ecological gain and salmon, salmon recovery bill, that was House Bill 1117, why it didn't pass, um, or I, I shouldn't say didn't pass, it didn't it didn't meet legislative deadlines, basically. It didn't move out of committee in time um, to basically stay alive during the legislative session. Um, and there, there was, um, I can't speak to why, but I do know that the development community isn't thrilled about that new standard of net ecological gain because it would basically make it harder to develop in areas that have wetlands or have other habitat features for salmon. Um, they would have to try to, to mitigate for those impacts um, above the current standards of what's known as no net loss. Um, so, but I will say that there's funding that's been allocated in the operating budget to look at you know, what do we define as net ecological gain and how can that come into play with the Growth Management Act, um, the Shoreline Management Act, as well as uh, the Model Toxics Control Act, which is how we govern um, cleaning up toxic cleanup sites like the Bellingham Waterfront and the Blaine Marina. So, um, but I will say that net ecological gain initially last year, I didn't, it didn't have a lot of support from the the local governments, um, the Association for Washington Cities and the Association of Washington Counties. Um, but this year we worked with them to try to address some of their concerns and they ended up supporting it. So um, that's a good sign, but it's really the, the development community that has concerns with it. So can I ask a follow-up question? Um, uh, that would be, um, in terms of the state then providing guidance to counties on incorporating climate measures into their, for instance, shoreline management plans, programs, or comprehensive plans, um, 
would most of them await that guidance or would they simply go ahead if they wanted to and incorporate those climate provisions? Um, that's a good question because in Whatcom County, we're already kind of trying to address climate change impacts and, um, and the same with the city of Bellingham and then also um, reduce our, our impacts on, on the climate, but um, it's essentially the guidance that the state is working on is directed towards cities to in include them in their comprehensive plan updates. And um, the guidance will be available in next year when some of the big counties like King County and Pierce and Snohomish counties start to update their comprehensive plans because they, they go before we do the smaller counties, like what, not that small, but the medium sized counties like Whatcom, um, they, they have a head start. So um, there's, going, there's going to be an attempt to try to pass that bill that incorporates climate change into growth planning um, next year. And this, this guidance that the state is doing is gonna help set the stage for that. Thank you. Yeah. And for folks just joining in, um, I'm just chiming in to say you can come off mute and ask your questions for Carly. You can pop them into the chat box. Um, I see a couple of questions coming into the chat box. So I'm just gonna um, pop in and, and start jumping down those Carly, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah. So the next question for you is um, natural erosion versus erosion by boat use. How much is natural and how much is the result of shipping power boating created wakes? And I, that's, that was from me, Lanita Christ. And I also just wanted to point out that um, I haven't had a chance to look at the shoreline management bill because I just recently joined the um, news feed for resources, which is a great thing to have. Um, but I, I know that as a boater who always is very careful about not doing shoreline eroding activities, I wondered if the shoreline management bill even addresses that at all. Yeah, that the shoreline man. Oh. Oh, did you have one last thought to add? No. no. Okay. The shoreline uh, bill doesn't address um, anything from boating. It's mainly just uh, looking at what's going on on the land and addressing people who have a uh, failing bulkhead or whatever, or seawall um, and looking at how, you know, what alternatives are there instead of just replacing it with another seat wall, if there's any capacity for them to consider, you know, um, soft shore armoring, which basically there is a protection element for property, but it's also um, utilizing woody structures to try to um, reduce the blows from wave action on property um, but it also provides some habitat. So, um, but as to the specifics of like how much erosion happens as a result of wave action naturally uh, versus boats, I can't speak to the specifics in Puget Sound, but that is a great question, I will say. Um, but my understanding is that often like there's, there's wake wake speed limits and things like that, or no wake zones to try to reduce those impacts. And, and maybe others on the call who are, you know, boaters could speak to that. I know Shannon is a fisherman um, and- Has a hand yeah, raised. Yeah, and you have a hand raised, Shannon. Yeah, uh, the shore erosion thing uh, probably is more of a lake related issue um, but that's, uh, you know, that wasn't necessarily why I raised my hand. I wanted to um, talk about Alex Rommel's visit um, and uh, him speaking about switching from uh, natural gas to all electric. I know the city is uh, pushing all new development to go to all electric and the question I posed to uh, Alex was okay 
So if you're going to go to all, all electric, we got an issue on the Columbia River. Numerous amount of dams there that are hydro powered. And his comment to that was that they were at capacity already and they're what and that um, uh, getting squeezing any more power out of the Columbia River was probably not going to happen given our power. Our power, meaning our river, provides power to a lot of the western states. So, so the question is, uh, if we're at capacity on the Columbia River for creating um, electricity required for new development, um, how are we going to be able to provide that power? And uh, if we're not, um, let's say, heating with natural gas and, you know, nukes are very, well, that's a touchy subject. So, you know, I just wanted to throw that out. You know, that's something that's probably going to be a very large issue. I know a lot of the salmon people are not happy about what's going on down on the Columbia River with their dams. Um, so I'll just, uh, that's a comment and not necessarily a need an answer. Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good comment. And I think something that um, advocates are trying to keep in mind, but I think that now with the clean fuel standard and other legislation, I think there's more of an emphasis to try to bring on other alternative um, energy sources like solar and wind, which of course they have their downsides as well um, for a number of reasons. Um, but that's you know something something to consider. Um, and I definitely don't have all the answers to that, but I do agree that you know the, the Snake River Dam and the other dams on the Columbia system do pose significant impacts to salmon stocks and salmon recovery. And yeah, it's something that we need to work through. Yeah, it's been big, my biggest gripe for a year. I tell people that, you know, half that or a good portion of that river belongs to Washington. And so, uh, you know, when we start shipping power out of state, uh, it affects our electrical market and, uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll, leave go. I'll leave that go, thanks. Carly, I could do one quick add on to address part of that. And I think that, um, uh, you know, Shannon, one thing in just in terms of Bellingham or a larger transition is it's absolutely a step-by-step -step process. So, um, you know, overall there's been a concern about things moving too quickly. Uh, in the case of Bellingham, the, the immediate step that the city is looking at would be just new construction and not even for um, individual residential homes, it's for commercial and multifamily homes. And then a process that would also be probably more incentive based than um, requirement based for existing, uh, existing buildings. So um, I think taking these, there's absolutely the, the many of the experts that the city and others are, are working with and following Seattle leads are looking at how do you deal with some of the energy load and that this would be, you know, over the course of a decade, not overnight. So hopefully um, I think that there's a pathway there that's not gonna leave anyone without electricity and also really mandates this um, transition that has to take place. Carol, I see a hand up. Yeah, it's not a question. I just wanted to add to that a little bit. And of course, these are all problems that resources can't necessarily solve, but it's a great place for us to have a dialogue and start looking at. And one of the things that I'm thinking for us locally, and I don't know a lot about it, but this is idea of generating energy from tidal waves. And that seems like something that we might be able to do close to us. And that might be something that could be included with all of the other options. Um, I don't know, I, my personal thought is maybe if we do all things in a small way locally, they can have a large impact but a, uh, for creating energy and a smaller damage impact. I don't know, it's just a thought. Yeah, thanks for bringing that, that forward and sharing your thoughts. 
Carol. I agree. Um, I'm going to jump us down into the next question here in our list. Um, and I know this is this is a big one through this session. Um, Carly, could you speak to um, whatever social justice protections are included in the carbon pricing bill? And that came from yeah. Rick. So that's yeah. Uh, that is Rick is referring to the Washington Climate Commitment Act, which was. Um, sponsored by Governor Inslee and ultimately passed. So Senate Bill, as I'm digging up my notes, um, 5126. Um, so this bill is also uh, basically referred to as cap and invest um, or cap and, cap and trade as many people may, may refer to it also. Um, and there were concerns from the, from from social justice organizations and frontline communities that, you know, based on, on experiences from California who instituted a cap and trade program um, almost a decade ago or so that th their emissions have um, not decreased in certain communities. And even they've, they've risen because of the system of being able to buy pass, pass your, your, uh, your pollution cap. Um, their air pollution cap with other entities. So if there's an entity that, you know, they're not exceeding their cap and they can trade whatever is left um, to other entities um, to exceed it and buy their way out of the, the pollution limit. So that was a concern. Um, the way that this bill has tried to address concerns um, from frontline communities is to basically institute an air quality monitoring program in, um, in areas that might see an increase in carbon emissions. And then there would be an action plan to try to address it. But from my read of it and what I've heard from frontline communities is that's a reactive position to be in because the pollution is gonna continue to happen and Instead, they're going to react to 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 it instead of be proact instead of proactively address it. And I will say that resources supported an alternative um, um, cap on carbon emissions known as the Washington Strong Act, and that was Senate Bill 5373. It was sponsored by our local state senator uh, Liz Lovelett in the 40th district, and this bill. Um, so in, in addition to putting a price on carbon emissions, it would also establish um, a green bond program. So it would make readily available funds for local governments um, and other entities to start investing in um, clean energy projects instead of waiting for that revenue to be there, which is what uh, the Climate Commitment Act does. Um, we have to wait until people start to pay for pollution um, to have those revenues go toward other investments, but a bond program makes it readily available. And then we can start paying it back when, when emitters start to pay for prices on carbon. So that was Washington strong was supported by front and centered and a bunch of other um, social justice organizations. And unfortunately it didn't advance and, um, I don't know the specifics as to why, but my guess is that it, that the Climate Commitment Act had a lot of momentum behind it because it was, you know, sponsored by the governor, and it, this has been on the governor's wish list um, for legislative action for years. So um, that's that's at least my read on it, and and others are welcome to chime in if they have thoughts or further questions. And I know that we're we're coming up on time here, but we've got a few more questions in the queue. So um, I'll keep us on and recording, and we'll we'll get through um, the questions. But if people need to hop off, um, do what they need to do, that is absolutely understandable. Um, I'm going to jump us into the next one, Carly, because I'm excited um, for this one. But what were what were the results of the plastic? ban um, that we worked on through our water lobby week. Yeah, uh, so the bill that passed was 5022 and this bill basically sets a, 
a prohibition on the use of styrofoam starting in 2023. Um, and it did, does a whole bunch of other things. Um, so the other piece of the bill is it requires um, certain percentages of post-consumer recycled content for plastic bottles, whether it's beverages or like cleaning, cleaning items and shampoo bottles, things like that. Um, it's kind of a, a phase in approach starting also in 2023 and increasing that percentage every few years for the amount of post-consumer recycled content in plastic items, as well as trash bags. Trash bags are included in that too. Um, and then the third element of the bill is a requirement um, for food service and um, food service businesses and restaurants to provide single use um, like cutlery and straws and um, things of that nature on demand so or upon request so instead of when you're you know getting takeout especially and some of us probably got takeout during COVID instead of visiting a sit-down restaurant um, you just get all of these napkins and and plastic spoons and forks that you don't necessarily need because you're going to take it home um, that uh, this bill would address that and it would require those establishments to ask if you would like to have those in the first place. So um, instead of you like saying, I don't need it because you often forget to, to say those things. I know I do. Um, and the plastic carry out bag ban. So it should be implemented later this year. I know the governor had a number of um, proclamations to try to like er encourage local governments who have had bag bans like the city of Bellingham to, you know, waive them during COVID. We know that COVID is generally not transmitted through um, uh, the use of these items. Um, by, when By these items, I mean like reusable bags and things like that. Um, and some places are now allowing you to bring them back, but you have to bag it yourself. Um, so anyway, that's, I don't know exactly when the bag ban that was passed last year, when it will be implemented, but I can try to, to answer that unless someone readily has it, has it known. And maybe Rick does because he works on plastic stuff locally. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. I see the, the hand raise. Yeah, I should know when the, um, when the prop, when the, uh, the, the limitation imposed by the governor is lifted and unfortunately I can't remember right now. For some reason I'm thinking September, but I, I, I'm not sure that's right at all. That's just, that's a, sort of a guess. I'm not sure why I'm thinking that. Um, I do know though, the, uh, the concern with, re, the, a big reason for um, stopping the implementation of local bag bans like in Bellingham was because with COVID, there was just a, a very big concern that uh, it would impose another financial hurdle on businesses that were already hurting to say, okay, now you have to stop using plastic bags and you have to go to something that is more expensive. Um, and so I think that was the biggest reason for prolonging the implementation start date. But whatever the start date is, I'm pretty sure it's in, in this year. Thank you so much. And I see folks are still on and um, we're still here. So Carly, I'm going to get us through um, two more questions and then we will um, call it a lunch and learn <laughs> office hour session. Um, can you, uh, let me make sure I'm in the right. Oh, um, so is the comprehensive plan process still being tracked, especially regarding the Cherry Point amendments? And that came from Lyle. Yeah, it is still, we're still working on it. Um, and I know that Shannon Wright, our executive director, could probably speak to specifics since she's been working on that. Um, but I understand that the county council will be likely introduced. I think they already did um, introduce the extension of a moratorium again, um, emergency moratorium for Cherry Point as has been passed the last number of years multiple times. Um, and Shannon, do you maybe want to talk about kind of where 
things are at in the process if you're available. Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Rick um, also has is fairly informed on this, I'd say, and has been on many of the same calls um, and tracking and presented as well. Uh, so the next step right now is that there are a set of revised ordinance, uh, revised ordinance that would update um, the comprehensive plan and create uh, stronger protections for Cherry Point. It is currently in the hands of the county um, county staff at planning and development to sort of clean up the document they're working on and also give it a quick review to be sure there's no uh, unintended legal issues or, or clarity. Um, I There's not an exact date, but I would anticipate fairly soon. It could be as soon as the next county council may be meeting, but likely after that, the county, the county council will likely introduce uh, the, the language and then there would be a, a process for a public hearing, which will be really important for uh, everyone in the county and beyond, because obviously what happens in Cherry Point affects the whole region, um, to weigh in and let our council members know what we think of them and any additional uh, changes that we'd really like to see. Um, so yeah, stay tuned in our May email that goes out the second week, we'll have a bit of an update in that we were just talking about. And Rick, do you wanna add anything? You've been tracking it quite closely as well. Yeah, I, I was uh, specifically involved in the financial assurance language uh, issues and not as much in the, in the other things, although I, I was following them. But I think that the uh, it was actually quite a remarkable process because the, the three interested stakeholder groups, the, the um, industry representatives from BP and uh, uh, Philip 66 and uh, Petrogas, uh, as well as representatives from labor, the folks that actually work out at the at the point, and then the, the environmental NGOs, all spent many months working together to try to agree to language in, in a variety of areas: financial assurance, greenhouse gas emissions, several others, um, that they could then present to the county council as something that they would all agree to. And they actually got to that point, which is pretty remarkable um, because those are three really uh, divergent groups in terms of what their concerns and interests are. And um, I, I was really uh, impressed with that and was happy to be a, a, a little part of it. And so what was presented to the council, now the council is not bound to follow that. Um, but of course, if they can follow that or agree to that themselves or something close to that, they're asking for some changes or revisions that the, uh, uh, the, the stakeholders are looking into now. But if, if that language or something close to it can then be accepted by the county, what that means is that the, there's a very small, very low likelihood of any legal challenge being raised to the language so that it could be implemented more quickly and without fear of, um, at least from those stakeholder groups of, of legal opposition rising. So it was really, um, I thought it was pretty amazing. I, 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 and I have to give a lot of, a lot of credit to Eddie Yuri who, who really got that whole stakeholder thing going um, and to resources for uh, supporting him and supporting the process because um, it was, especially in the beginning, it was not an easy slog at all. Yeah, great, Rick, thank you. I think uh, your contribution has been really, um, really helpful in all of it. And, you know, it's one of, uh, in taking the language that the county was looking at and seeing if there were areas that we could collectively push it further, um, I think that the process has yielded something even stronger. Um, it's not, you know, if, if I were to start from scratch right now, and are there a few things that I think resources would like to see in addition? Absolutely. Is it stronger than it was nine months ago? It is as well. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Carly, do you have time for one more question? Okay. Yeah, um, I, I'm free. <laughs> great, great, okay. The last question, um, also another great exciting one, is can you speak to some of the weekend or we the language issues um, that surrounded the adjudication bill? Yeah, so there was um, 
in the original proposal from the governor's office in the operating budget, there's, you know, it's a multi hundred page document and the adjudication for the Nooksack watershed is one element. It's called the proviso. Um, and there's language that adjoins the amount of money that's allocated to do the adjudication work. So um, for Whatcom County, um, there's there's money that's specifically set aside um, for Whatcom County to to use $250,000 over the course of two years. Um, the clock starts ticking July 1st. That's when the new budget comes into play. Um, and it goes through June 30th of 2023. So the funds basically for Whatcom County were kind of broad, broadly stated to allow for um, you know, a, a facilitated process um, to bringing parties to the table to talk about, you know, what what might we want to see in um, a potential settlement and or using it to um, further technical studies or technical work in the watershed that could be used in an adjudication process. Um, and to just be clear, the settlement piece um, is something that can only take place once an adjudication is commenced, um, and that's in a court process. So um, really, there's no settlement that can happen outside of a court process. And we have our lovely legal friends, Rick and others, to thank for you know educating the community on these things. I know it's really helped me. Um, but the piece that was added at the end in this final operating budget basically adds more, more credence to and weight toward um, trying to have these facilitated discussions um, that are supposedly supposed to help a settlement process. And um, from our perspective, we think that any money that's going towards facilitation is probably money not spent wisely when it's almost like you're, you could be wasting money having these conversations um, that might just go out the window at some point. So we would rather see money go toward technical work. There are, all, there are already needs in the watershed that we've identified um, that need more study or, or need more data. And that's what um, this could go toward, such as, you know, what's, what is the what is the impact of you know using groundwater and how does that influence stream flow um, especially since there's a lot of talk of transitioning farmers from you know taking water directly from streams to using it more from the ground and we know that uh, groundwater is connected and it often influences stream flow but we don't know to what extent we don't know the nitty-gritty details so you know, more information on that would be helpful. And the county already has a groundwater model, but it's not precise enough. It only gives us a lot of high level information. So we need these details for, um, you know, when things go forward with adjudication or other potential solutions. Shannon, would you like to jump in? Yeah, so I think you're headed in the right direction there. Rick might want to uh, comment, but um, um, I think we've been in facilitations for over 20 years and it's resulted in nothing. So um, is facilitation in the language uh, that's been presented to Whatcom County? And when they say facilitation, are we talking outside of the outside of the courts or inside in, inside the case, Rick? My recollection is that it talked about facilitated discussions focusing especially on um, tribal interests, um, I think, but that it wasn't super specific about exactly what should be done, but there is some money carved out, a hundred some thousand, dollars, I believe, to assist or, or to, for Whatcom County to try to provide 
something that would be facilitated discussions, exactly what that would look like or um, what the scope would be is, is not really specified in the language. Um, and the, 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 the problem with that is that there's been a lot of confusion sown with regard to this, especially by interests who would rather not see adjudication happen, that um, adjudication is just a legal proceeding. It's, it's, a, it's a courtroom proceeding. Um, and in any courtroom proceeding, there's always the possibility of settlement. And in fact, it's usually in, through courtroom proceedings that settlement happened because um, once you're in a court, you have something to lose. And rather than leave it up to a court, a court and a jury to, to decide your fate, if you can settle with the other party, then you may not get everything you want, but you, you have less at risk. And so um, settlement will happen in the adjudication process. Uh, the Yakima settlement that just resolved last year, the year before, I forget when, but have been going for decades, that resolved by way of, an, of a settlement. And the adjudication forces all of the parties who have an interest in a legal, their legal claim in, in water rights in the, in the watershed, they have to come together or their, their claim will not be uh, looked at by the court. The process of adjudication is simply one where the court looks at all the claims submitted to it and then determines which claims are legitimate and what, their, what their con the content of the claim is. What makes it complicated is there's thousands of claims <laughs> because it's a big watershed. Um, and so uh, when you get everyone involved though, because it's a court proceeding and, and they have a, a lot to risk, that's when the process of settlement is most greatly facilitated, not by individual effort, but by just the context in which it's happening. And so um, spending money on a facilitated process before the adjudication, it's just not gonna work. That's why we haven't had a settlement up to now to begin with, because parties, if they don't like what they're being offered, they just walk away. Uh, in, in a court uh, context, the court is there to bring all the parties together and has the hammer of saying, if you don't settle, then I'm going to decide your claims for you. You may not like it. So um, spending money on that is just uh, going to be a waste of money, just like all the money that's been spent on attempts to settle claims over the past few decades has been a waste of money and time um, because there's no motivation to the parties um, to, to work something out for fear of something worse happening if they don't work something out. So um, real quick, I don't wanna to take too much more time on this, but what bothers me is the state of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife are the ones that are um, supposed to be representing my best interest as a fisher, uh, commercial fisher. And that's where I, uh, uh, that's what I'm worried about. And uh, uh, we're, we're not, we meaning the commercial industry is not part of the lead agency. So we could stand to lose a lot here. So, you know. But, and it, I don't have any faith in the state of Washington. I'm sorry, I've got 50, 50 years in the commercial fishing industry and I've seen, seen the resource, you know, uh, tumble. And uh, so I guess that's my position here. Well, I know that we are we are well over time and I appreciate all of you staying on to continue this conversation. Um, thank you so much, Carly, for answering questions, getting into the tough questions and tough answers. Um, this was a big legislative session. Um, I do want to let folks know that if you're not already on our email list and I'm popping this into the, uh, the chat, you can text resources, all one word, to 40649 um, and that will get you signed up um, for our text messages and for our emails and you can keep in the loop on what we're up to, which includes um, legislative action work. Um, I also just wanted to let everyone know here today that through our spring fundraising, um, all donations are matched right now. Um, and I'm just popping in a link for um, that donation match as well. If you're interested, um, wouldn't be doing my job in digital engagement if I didn't let you know. Um, but thank you all so much. And if you have follow up questions um, and want to talk to us more, or if you want to see more of these or have 
ideas um, for communi communicating legislative work differently um, our next go round. Um, I know Carly and I would also love to hear that. So please feel free to get in touch and chat with us and um, let us know how we're doing and what you're looking for. And we're just so happy to have had you here. Thanks yeah, here. thanks everybody. Thank you all. Yeah, have a good lunch. All right, see ya.